I think we need to understand now how the economy works. Um, and the best way to start um, on this is to, to look at banks. Now, if you go out in the streets and you ask anyone, what's the most important thing in the economy? Most people will say things like money, banking, hard work. But they will certainly mention the monetary side. If you ask an economist, they will talk about anything, but not money and not banks. Um, as I'll, I'll try to show you today, economics has been one of those uh, research disciplines where a lot of control was implemented very early on. In fact, I think it's been the model uh, for what's been happening in other disciplines, including medicine, medical research much more recently, where you have false theories that are being proclaimed and dissidents are being suppressed and the truth is being suppressed. I think we all know and we all sense banks are somehow important. So let's, let's talk about this. How do banks actually work? Now, you may be surprised to find that for the last century, there have been three theories of banking. Now, these are three different theories. They're contradictory theories. So the experts hadn't actually agreed on how banks really work. The dominant theory is the financial intermediation theory. That's still uh, proclaimed today. Banks are not so important. They're just financial intermediaries. They gather deposits, do the analysis, then lend out the funds. Just like other non-bank financial uh, players and also just like financial markets in general. So you don't really have to worry too much about banks. Nothing to see here, you know, walk on. That is the dominant theory. Then slightly older theory, dominant from the 1930s to the 1960s, is the fractional reserve theory, which said each individual bank is just an in intermediary, just like that. It's not important. But somehow, this theory still admitted, somehow something is happening in the banking system. And as these banks interact, somehow money is being created. Of course, if you listen to that theory, then you'd, you'd realize, okay, there is much more to this. Uh, they talk about the money multiplier. Wow, what is that? The money multiplier? <laughs> that sounds interesting. So um, I guess when this theory was dominant, they realized, okay, this is still too much information in here. And that's when they introduced the financial intermediation theory. That's now in the textbooks. No more money multiplier, no more um, money creation in the banking system. Um, but in the fractional reserve theory, each individual bank was only an intermediary. And we have the third theory, which says, which says no, that's wrong. Each individual bank is not a financial intermediary. Banks don't intermediate. Banks create money. Each individual bank creates money out of nothing, which is um, perhaps the most radical theory. That one was dominant until the 1920s, 1930s, um, 100 years ago. Now, which one is correct? Um, I guess the scientific thing is to, is to conduct an empirical test of those three theories. But you'd be amazed to, to hear that for this whole century, no such test had been conducted. Because the way economics has been operating is to just proclaim something and suppress alternative views without the scientific basis, something very familiar. Uh, from the last uh, sort of two years in, in, the, in the health uh, sciences. Now, these three theories differ in the question of where the money for a new bank loan comes from. So if a bank gives you a loan, a mortgage, the question is, where does that money come from? And that's where these three theories say different things. The financial intimidation theory says it comes from other people's deposits. The fractional reserve theory says it's from excess reserves at the central bank. And the credit creation theory says, comes from nowhere. The banks just invented. Each bank, each local small bank, even Raiffeisen Bank, uh, local community bank, they just, every bank, whether large or small, when they lend, they just invent the money. Um, so this is the textbook story, uh, which is the financial intermediation theory. Banks gather savings, do their job, and then lend out money. And the older story, fractional reserve, the banks put some money with reserves in the central bank. Um, but the third theory had not really been taught for a century, the credit creation theory. And um, 
we need to, to do some empirical tests. Now, economists say banks are deposit-taking institutions that lend money, which seems reasonable. But in social sciences, uh, we have the advantage that the rules, the laws of the social universe are man-made. If you're a, a physicist, your job is to discover the laws of physics, to discover the laws of nature that have been implemented, and you can't change them. Of course, in social sciences, the big difference is we can change those rules, and the rules are the law. So let's take a legal approach first um, and check whether it's true that banks at law are deposit-taking institutions that lend money. And what we find is that actually, no, banks don't take deposits and banks don't lend money. And you see that in the law. Because at law, a bank deposit doesn't exist. A bank deposit is simply a loan that you give to the bank. So there is no such thing as a bank deposit at law. Secondly, banks don't lend money. Um, banks are in the business of purchasing securities, IOUs, debt instruments. Now, when you get a loan from the bank, you say, well, I don't care about those details, give me the money. The bank will purchase your loan agreement, your mortgage agreement. That's an IOU, a debt instrument, a security that you, the borrower, is issuing. And then you say, just give me the money. And the bank, if they're careful, they will say, you'll find it in your account with us. If they say, we'll transfer it to your account, that's incorrect. Because no transfer takes place. But you will be credited that money in your account. And where does it come from? From nowhere. It's invented because deposits are simply the record of the bank's debt to you. Because there's no such thing as deposit. It's when you lend money to the bank. And if you borrow money from the bank, then the loan contract also obliges the bank to pay you something which will be recorded as a deposit that nobody has paid in. It's a fictional deposit that the bank invents and credits you with it. And that is how our money supply is created. So we've had these three theories of banking. And money creation doesn't come in in the financial intermediation theory. In the fractional reserve theory, individual banks don't create money, but systemically um, they do. Um, and in the credit creation theory, each bank creates money, the system creates money. But which one is empirically correct? So I conducted the first empirical test uh, a few years back in the 5,000-year history of banking. And the answer was, well, the financial intermediation theory was rejected. Um, essentially, I took out a loan from a bank. The bank had to cooperate with me because I had to look inside their system um, and their operations. What do they do? And I confirmed that, no, the deposits are not touched when the money is paid out to me. The reserves were not touched at all. So where did the money come from that I borrowed? It was just invented out of nothing. Um, there's two papers on this, 2014-2016. Uh, can banks individually create money out of nothing? If you Google that, you get the paper. It's one of the most downloaded um, papers in all of Elsevier's scientific publications. So the textbook story is wrong. Banks create money out of nothing. And here's how it works. Um, as I said, the bank will purchase your loan contract, put it on the asset side of the balance sheet. That lengthens the, um, the balance sheet of the, of the bank. And then as, you, as the bank pays out the money, in inverted commas, it credits the borrower's account with the same amount, uh, which is a bank liability. And the test was about where does this money come from? It's not transferred from anywhere inside the bank or anywhere outside the bank. It's newly created. And of course, it has to match because you've lengthened the balance sheet. Um, and that's how our money supply is created. That's where 97% of our money comes from. The banking system creates it out of nothing. And that's, of course, why banks are important. That's why banks drive the economy, and their decisions reshape the economic landscape. This is called credit creation. So banks create money through the credit creation process. That makes banks very powerful. They make this decision of who gets new purchasing power and uh, for what purpose it's used. Of course, central banks um, are the powerful institutions that can control the banks and tell them what to do. And very often, they conduct their monetary policy by 
guiding bank credit, but they usually don't talk about it. They usually don't want people to realize that this is how it works, the fact that banks create money out of nothing, and that monetary policy really only works if it influences bank credit creation. So that's a game changer for all the economic questions. Once you understand this, you realize we don't have to have unemployment. We don't have to have business cycles. We don't have to have recurring banking crises because these are all accounting problems, accounting fictions that can be very easily solved. They don't have to be real problems if you don't want them to be. And sadly, that's what we find that often decision makers want them to be problems. We don't have to have underdevelopment. There don't need to be underdeveloped countries. And of course, we don't need to deplete finite resources, uh, but we can actually deploy things so that there is an abundance for everyone. Prosperity for everyone is possible if you deploy bank credit creation correctly. Now, now that you know this, actually just maybe um, the technical um, expression of this, you can put this in some formula. Total money is, is credit, credit creation in the banking system. You can divide into two streams going into the uh, economy, GDP, national income, or credit money creation can also be used for non-GDP transactions, which is asset purchases. When banks lend for the purchase of ownership rights, then money goes into asset markets. And of course, you can imagine when that happens, um, this is unproductive credit creation. Um, asset purchases funded by banks, whether it's property, real estate, or financial instruments, or um, mergers, acquisitions, takeover of other companies, lending to private equity funds, hedge funds, all that's over here. In many countries, that's the dominant form of bank credit vastly outclassing any other form. And what you then get is asset price inflation. It's like printing a lot of money, pumping it into asset markets. What's going to happen with asset prices? Of course, they're going to go up. Um, it's a Ponzi scheme, a, a pyramid scheme, a snowball scheme. This will only work while banks continue to create more credit for asset purchases. Once they stop, uh, it's like a game of musical chairs. The music ends. There's not enough chairs for everyone uh, because asset prices don't rise any further. Late coming investors go bust first. You have non-performing loans. The banks then restrict lending for asset purchases. Asset prices really collapse. Then you have a major banking crisis. The, um, this is, of course, unsustainable, um, unproductive and unsustainable. And because during these asset bubbles, you push up asset prices by several hundred percent. But from the peak, they only need to drop by 10 percent. And you've busted the banking system because banks only have... 10% or less equity, which is used when you have non-performing loans. And so the banks, therefore, are easily bankrupted and there's easily a banking crisis. But we don't have to have this. It can be easily prevented, or even if you have a banking crisis, you can easily get out of this. Um, the other uses of money, um, there's one more unsustainable, unproductive form in the real economy that's consumer loans, as you can imagine, because you create more money, more demand, but there's no more goods and services. Consumer price inflation follows. And then um, we have the redeeming feature of the banking system. If banks create credit for productive purposes, for productive business investment, for the implementation of new technologies, increasing uh, productivity, you will get growth, you will get prosperity. This also delivers um, income streams to service and repay the loans, and therefore you don't have systemically the problem of non-performing loans. There's never been a banking crisis due to too much small firm business investment, <laughs> so, because that's productive business investment that creates jobs and prosperity. And the interesting thing is we can have more growth and higher growth, even at full employment, because the only limit to growth actually is human ingenuity, and that is virtually without limit. We have plenty of ideas, new technologies, new inventions. Um, they just need to be funded with credit creation, and you can then implement them and turn them into prosperity because you get this new value added that's created and that can be shared. If you have a banking system that is structured so that you can share easily, which is a very decentralized banking system with many small banks, local banks, community banks. But we'll come to that. Um, and so 
you can test this. This is the quantity theory of disaggregated credit. Credit in the real economy drives GDP credit for asset prices. Asset purchase drives asset markets. In Japan here, Japanese data, uh, they, they increased bank credit in the early 70s drastically. Um, in the real estate market, driving up asset prices, real estate prices here, then created a crash. They did this in the UK as well. Mostly central banks operate in a very uh, coordinated fashion. When you increase credit for financial circulation as a share of total credit, this dramatically, of course, you are creating an asset bubble. That's the creation of the 1980s great Japanese asset bubble when the little plot of land in central Tokyo around the Imperial Palace um, was worth as much as the entire state of California, including Los Angeles and San Francisco. These were um, the data that was um, what was created, this massive asset bubble. And, and here's the, uh, another way of showing this. Broad credit creation, total credit creation, way in excess of GDP growth. That's this excess money creation for asset purchases, uh, creating an asset bubble. And then a banking crisis the moment you reduce bank credit. Um, so let's now with this tool and this understanding, we can actually now solve any economic problem. And there's many that traditional theories cannot explain. But since I'm supposed to speak for only three and a half minutes, <laughs> I believe, <laughs> or was that three and a half per slide? <laughs> um, um, I can't uh, go through all the other puzzles which, which can be solved with this, but let's just return to the inflation of the 70s. So why do we have this inflation? Remember they told us it's because of the war and then the OPEC um, oil embargo and this energy supply shock. But let's look at the data. Um, this is bank credit creation in the US and we find that it was revved up dramatically by June 71 already growing by 13.5%, which is the highest post-war at that time. And that's 71. Then peak in March 73 at 16.4%. Massive money creation pumped into the economy. What's going to happen with nominal GDP? What's going to happen with inflation? Of course, you are going to create inflation later. The, the war only happened and the OPEC um, oil price shock only happened in autumn 1973. And therefore, we know the cause is actually, of course, the credit boom created by the banking system under the auspices of the Federal Reserve. There was a second oil price shock, we're told, in the late 70s. Well, actually, no, that's another credit shock um, in the late 70s that caused this. And the same is true for other countries. Um, in Germany, bank credit growth expanded by 14%. And that was before the so-called OPEC oil price shock. And that's really why inflation rose. Japan, where we had much higher inflation, well, we had much higher bank credit expansion, 25.5% December 72. That's before the alleged official cause, the oil price shock. So the 70s inflation was not due to energy prices. And likewise, today's inflation is not due to energy prices or the war. As you know, because of course the war only started in Ukraine, only started the end of February, but the inflation was already very high even before then. So it's quite apparent that the official narrative is wrong. And remember, we looked at this, how the Japanese central bank created massive um, a massive asset bubble in 1972. That's never mentioned. Um, very briefly, let's look at the current situation. A lot of people did not expect the 2020 massive monetary expansion by the Federal Reserve and other central banks to lead to inflation because they compared to 2008. In 2008, it was the other way around. There was a financial crisis. The Federal Reserve massively expanded in quantitative terms, what many people call quantitative easing, and they expected inflation in a weaker dollar. I was one of the few economists who were saying, no, we're not going to get um, inflation or a, weak, or a weaker dollar because they are not actually creating more money. And that's because the central bank is a small cog in the, in the game of money creation. The banking system is much bigger. And bank credit creation then was shrinking, it was negative. 
that's when the, the Federal Reserve stepped in and created a lot of um, dollars. But in absolute terms, total money supply was still shrinking because the banking system was contracting. So, of course, you couldn't get inflation at that time. But it's been totally different in the 2020 um, reflation because the Federal Reserve injected money, similarly to 2008, but the banking system has been creating much more money. In fact, it was one of the, the highest growth rates since the 70s. Um, then there was a period of contraction, but you notice that the Federal Reserve is not anymore expanding quantitatively this much, but the banking system continues to create credit. So the inflation is going to continue. And of course, inflation is stealth taxation, um, and it is an unnecessary restriction on the prosperity that we could have 